Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. Shares for Beginners. Weekend Watch List. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners Weekend Watch List, where we take a close look at an individual company that you may wish to consider for your watch list. It's not a recommendation to buy, but a way for you to learn how Stockopedia screens for value. Joining me today is Elio D'Amato, and we're talking Resolute Mining, ASX code, RSG. So, good morning, Elio. Tell us about RSG and its status as the winner in the NAPS portfolio. Yeah, good morning, Phil. And look, there's many different aspects to this business that I'm sure we're going to talk about, but it was included in the NAPS portfolio this time around for 2024. For those that are unaware as to what our fancy acronym means, it means no admin portfolio system. So basically, we just choose the top two of every sector that's out there, and effectively, we hold them and buy them on the 1st of January. And then we irrespective of whether it rain, hails or shines, as it were, we hold on to the stock the entire way through the year. Basically, to show you that a portfolio that doesn't require much attention can actually work, assuming you're holding good quality businesses in total. And Resolute's one of those companies that has done quite well. And I thought we could talk about it, Phil, because obviously we haven't talked about a gold miner up until recently. And of course, gold's trading at all-time highs. So there's a lot of interest in this sector as a whole. I mean, we all think of price takers as being those in the energy metal space where we know the prices have been slaughtered. But then there's the gold side where prices are at record highs and Resolute's been benefiting from that. So hence why we're uh, talking about it today. Yes, and I've noted the pictures of the queues of people outside of AC Bullion in Martin Place in Sydney just trying to get their hands on the physical stuff. Yeah, which is generally a time to be worried, of course, whenever when, as they said in my early times of learning about shares, when the taxi driver starts giving you tips, that's the point you want to get out. And look, obviously, the more interest there is in the commodity, which we're currently seeing at the moment, that's obviously driving a lot of these operational businesses because, of course, as price takers, as the name suggests, a large part of their revenue is going to be determined by the price of the commodity that they take out of the ground. And in the case of RSG, that is gold, but it's also in Africa. So there's a bit of a premium also in regards to its business and the risks that are associated with it that we do need to consider. But ultimately, Yes, of course. At record highs, it's unsurprising to see much of that has been reflected in RSG's balance sheet and what they've been able to achieve. But not only that, they're also expected to continue to grow in terms of their production, which is why they're being brought up for discussion today. And it's up 42.31% over the calendar year. So it's done very well, hasn't it so far? And it's done, uh, yeah, particularly much better than the underlying commodity. And I think this is a good lesson for investors who are out there thinking about investing in a gold miner when it comes to their exposure to gold, because of course, we need to remember that being in a company, not only do you carry the risk of the commodity side, but you also carry the operational risk. So if there are any deaths, unfortunately, on site, although fortunately with RSG, there haven't been any in three years. Anything relates to drill bit breaking, for example, or a truck breaking down or whatever the case may be. So one of the common misconceptions is if they want exposure to gold, they go out and they buy a gold miner. But unfortunately, in the case of any gold miner, we need to remember that there are not only, yes, the price taker which drives the revenue, but there's also the cost of getting it out of the ground. And issues and challenges there can sometimes impact the price. But in this instance, it's definitely EHA and they've been doing quite well. So tell us about the Resolute operation and especially the importance of their presence in Africa where they're getting most of their gold from. I can't help but remember that famous Leonardo DiCaprio uh, saying, this is Africa. <laughs> Every time he says that, thinking about Resolute. But, and, they, but, and, and the classic Toto song as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very much. Going even further back, very good, Phil. But look, I mean, never at rains, the moment... Never rains here. <laughs> no, it never rains. It never, ever does. <laughs> but look, uh, but, which is it actually... Pours, in, it pours gold. It pours gold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is 
actually an interesting segue into one of their production areas, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But currently, there's two main areas that they are focused on. They're Siama Pit, which is in Mali, which is where the majority of the gold currently comes from in terms of production. And then there's the Mako mine, which is located in Senegal. And the reigning bit is interesting because in their latest quarterly production report that the company produced, they actually flagged a one in a 1,000 year rain event that had affected the mine quite significantly and that it had actually been flooded in and not only curbing production, of course, but obviously causing them to also downgrade their production guidance on the back of that. It's interesting because obviously it does rain in Africa, but I suppose the other thing that makes it interesting is that by this time next year, the company doesn't expect to be taking more gold out of Mako because it's definitely in a wind down phase. There are some activities in regards to expanding the current mine life as it were a little bit outside of where the current pit is. I think if I remember correctly, it's Tomboron Koto. But either way, that will extend that a little bit longer, but it won't be in the existing pit. So interesting to see that. But look, it gets the gold out of the ground for cheap and it does operate out of Africa and labor is much cheaper there as we know. But the price that they receive is obviously what everyone gets on a global scale. So the margins are quite good. And therefore, as a result, that goes straight to the bottom line and in particular, straight into their cash balance, which has been incredibly strong and is growing on the back of these record prices. So what's your take on the quarterly report that was just released a few days ago? Oh, look, there's some quite good parts about it. I mean, for example, they're sitting on 11.2 million ounces of mineral resource. So they produce around 345 to 365 thousand ounces per year of gold. And they're all in sustaining costs around that 1,300 to 1,400 mark, although that is forecast to come in at the upper end on the back of some royalty payments which have had to be made. Hey, it is Africa after all. But nonetheless, there was some signs in regards to their exploration activity, not only in Mali and Singapore, but we also got Guinea. We got some input in regards to what they're going to be doing there. And we also got information on their Côte d'Ivoire or Ivory Coast uh, JV that they currently have in practice at the moment. So Look, it was okay, but I think analysts did downgrade the company on the back of the problems at Mako and what that ultimately means for production moving forward, or at least for their financial year, which actually ends in December. So I think that will be weighing on the sentiment a little bit, but hey, gold at record prices and you know what? The company keeps going in a northeasterly direction. So investors have three main options. Actually, there are a couple of other ways of doing, but the three main ways to invest in gold is the physical stuff, like going down to AC Bullion and uh, going, <laughs> waiting uh, in queue. Yeah. Up, yeah, waiting in a queue. There's buying gold miners and their ETFs. What are the different strategies involved in those three ways of gaining exposure? Yeah, look, obviously, they're the three main ways that us as regular punters get exposure. And I think it's important to note that other than waiting in a queue, once you receive that bullion bar or whatever amount that you do actually purchase, you then have to find a way to secure it, lock it up, make sure it's safe. You could, of course, pay you know, a mint to look after it for you, but of course, that costs and that needs to be included in your total return. Further to that, you won't receive a dividend on the back of that either. So it'll just literally sit there. And basically, it's the capital value as to whether that goes up or down that will ultimately determine what it is that it's worth. Then you do have the ETF option, which is priced uh, here. The most common one is gold, G-O-L-D, which is obviously priced in US dollar terms in regards to that. So there is a currency impact that you do need to consider and probably also consider that too with regards to holding the physical gold because, of course, that is a key determinant in regards to your total return. And obviously, you can then trade gold. It's physical gold that's held for you. It's held in a mint, et cetera, et cetera. All those good things, just you don't actually physically hold the stuff. So you can't actually go in there and rub yourself in it while you're naked or any of those things you like to do with all that money of yours, Phil. You can't necessarily go out and do that. You do have to leave it to the market to ultimately determine where the fair price is and hence what your total return is. Although then you can go into the operational which is like we've talked with Resolute, which has paid dividends way in the past and you know, paid them in the future as well, given the strength of their cash flow and where that's been as well. 
But obviously, that carries risks, and a large part of that is operational risks. For example, that one in a 1,000 rain event, which has impacted that Mako mine and led to the downgrade in production guidance, which analysts are looking over. So it's important we understand that they're the three main ways we can get exposure to gold, but they're all different in their unique ways, and they all carry different risks that you all need yet that you need to be cognizant of before you go down any particular strategy. Although many people invest in the miners because they believe that they're going to get extra leverage against the price of the gold as well, that you're going to get more bang for your buck in term when the price of gold goes up. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, you look at RSG, for example, they're currently looking at expanding their Siama gold processing facility, which will allow them to process something like over 400 million ounces of gold per year, which is effectively double the size of a little bit more than that of where they are currently. Plus, there's also Guinea, which they're quite excited about. I think it's called Mansala is the name of that particular mine. And they obviously got high hopes for that, as well as their JV with Ivory Coast business, which really, to be quite frank and honest, you can only make any money out of that region with regards to a JV because it is definitely the Wild West if there's anything to be taken there. And at least in Guinea, they're somewhat more politically stable. And there's also extensions to the strike of where they've got some 6.6, I think it is, million ounces of mineral reserve. They're looking to expand that out to the north, south, and I think deeper down as well. So there's also quite a bit of excitement there, which is also what investors buy into whenever they consider these types of stocks, not just exposure to the commodity, but that production upside. And their latest quarterly gave us some indication of that. But of course, they're playing a lot of their cards to their chest because, well, yep, it is Africa. Are you picking shares on gut instinct? Buying on press tips or rumours, do you struggle to find the time to keep up with the research and analysis that goes into evaluating potential stocks? Stockopedia are pleased to offer a special deal to listeners of this podcast, a 14-day free trial and a 10% discount on the first year of membership. Sign up now at y.stockopedia.com slash sfb. There's no better time to access the most comprehensive, easy-to-use investing toolbox for DIY share investors. 10% 10% off, 14-day free trial, and a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's why.stockopedia.com slash SFB. And JV is joint venture, obviously, and in many of these kind of constituencies, a joint venture is required for political, family, <laughs> all sorts of reasons that we might not be used to in the legally constrained West. That's a great way to put it, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to be nice. So <laughs> what is all in sustaining cost and why is it such an important number for miners? Okay, so this is really where the lights light up as it were. So AISC is all in sustaining costs and that is effectively what it costs a company to take gold out of the ground. And in the case of Africa, it is cheap to do so. I mean, if we're looking at RSG, they are forecasting for their full year somewhere between 1300 to 1400 dollars US dollars, that is, all in sustaining costs. Now, when you consider that the price of gold at the moment in US dollar terms is around $2,700 per ounce, then that effectively means that all of that is margin straight to the bottom line. And we saw that in their latest production report where we saw a good strong increase in regards to the level of cash that they have on hand because you would expect that in terms of profitability that that would flow through to the cash flow statement and that has definitely done that in the case of RSG. I suppose there's a lot of mineral everywhere in regards to Africa. There's a number of Australian companies who have done very well being over there and have yielded strong returns with domestic investors. But there's also just as many, if not longer, a list of companies that have come a cropper in regards to trying to navigate that scenario and really have been blindsided by some particular moves from various governments. And therefore, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, this all in sustaining costs, because if you look at someone like let's say a Vault, for example, who is a mid-tier Australian producer at the moment currently focused predominantly in Australia. They're all in sustaining costs, are generally in Australian dollar terms, are around you know, $2,300, $2,400, which seems like a lot. I think if you discount that back into US dollar terms, it works out to be $1,800, $1,900, or even a little bit less. 
But nonetheless, you sit there and you go, geez, that is a lot more expensive. But obviously, there's a premium that comes with being in a stable jurisdiction and what comes with that, plus paying the wages that all those people holding lollipop sticks in the middle of the outback uh, definitely need in order to fund their lifestyle, which I wouldn't have thought would have been much. But anyway, who am I to differ? Nonetheless, obviously, those all in sustaining costs are higher, whereas in Africa, they are much cheaper, which is one of the attractive things with regards to RSG, because if they can operationally deliver on what they say they can, then the cost of extracting it out of the ground is actually a hell of a lot less than it would be domestically here in Australia. And that's why so many investors are focused on this number, because it's a nice, neat number, and it tells us exactly what it costs to get the gold out of the ground. And obviously, when we see rises, we want to know why. In the case of RSG, it's because that there have been increased royalty payments in regards to their Mali operation, which obviously is going to come back a little bit down towards the bottom line. For any other business, you want to look at whether it goes up or down and why and understand those reasons why, because that is a key determinant. Because margins are the great profit expander. You know, in a price taker like this, margins are everything. So if the price of the commodity is going up, Well, it's no real good if your margins are basically the same and you're not really benefiting from the increasing price because as with all cyclical businesses, when the tide turns, then obviously if the margins haven't really improved, then that is going to impact that bottom line even more significantly. And therefore, that is something that we do need to watch. So it's what all of us junior investors can do. We can look at that nice, clean number and understand the drivers behind it because ultimately, when it comes to a producer... Obviously, if you're not producing, you've got no always to stay cost because you're not digging anything out of the ground. But if you're actually a producer at the moment, then that is one of the key metrics to look at when it comes to a gold miner because if there is an increase, you want to understand why. Because if anything, you've got to keep that margin, break that tram track as it were, particularly now given the gold prices at record highs. So just digging into that all-in sustaining cost number, is it a price per tonne extracted? Is that what it's about? Or no, it's or? actually price per ounce. So because right. the mm-hmm. price of gold is quoted on a per ounce basis, then so is the all-in sustaining cost quoted on a per ounce basis. So it's really easy for you to basically compare what they're getting versus what they're paying and make an opinion on that. And obviously the difference between that is going to govern a lot of what the share price of, of these operators does in the near term, to which RSG has been benefiting significantly and hence why you've seen the share price rise that you've talked about. Okay, so what about the outlook and risks? Is sovereign risk a part of this as well? <laughs> yeah, well, it's Africa, as uh, Leonardo told us all. So we do need to remember that there's always a risk when it comes to a gold miner geopolitical risks are a massive one. I mean, you need to remember that their big mine at uh, Siamma is something like 300 k's or something from the Ivory Coast border. So there could be something that occurs there in that regard where they just go in and take it over. I don't know what could possibly happen there. There's a whole range of other risks operationally. So like we had with the Mako mine in Senegal, where we had that's a big rain event. Well, if that had have occurred at Mali, at Siama, this would have been a significantly different discussion that we would be having at the moment. So operationally, we need to appreciate that these things do impact the business and do impact the amount of gold that they can extract out of the ground. And therefore, that is a risk that we need to be very alert to. So geopolitical risk as well as operational risk are two of the key things that we do need to watch. And then there's a whole bunch of other risks like currency and commodity risk and all that sort of thing, which is just part and parcel of playing a game in regards to being invested in these types of stocks. But ultimately, if you're paying in US dollars and you're gaining in US dollars, then it's quite easy to see that relative gap. And if you can operationally kick goals, then you're going to be doing well. So fingers crossed they can get this recent rain event out of their head. They can get Tom Bor on Toco online in the near term. And then, of course, you've got their Guinea operations at Mansala. And then hopefully they can get that JV working for them in the Ivory Coast, which will work to their benefit as well. So a little bit more to play out, quite a few risks. That's why African miners can some, – that's why sometimes it seems too good to be true. Problem is – It probably is (laughs) if you look in it too deeply. But in regards to this company here, 
It's a long history in Africa, doing quite well, and they've also got plans to expand, which is what the main reason why they excite me anyway. And one of the key reasons also in regards to the NAPS portfolio, their inclusion was on the back of that consistent production increase over the long term. I noticed in the latest quarterly report that incidences of workplace injuries were zero. And that can be another risk as well for miners as well. Like if suddenly there's a a mine collapse and people are killed and people are hurt, this can really affect the way it's perceived in the market as well, as well as the time that's needed to close down operations and fix the problems. Yeah, bingo, throw that all into operational risks because, yeah, you get a mine that's got a disaster that occurs there and it can be shut for literally months upon months, which then means it's reliant on the generosity of investors to keep the company solvent and keep it going. Otherwise, it's going to shut down. And I think that is an important thing to remember and hence why we need to consider these risks whenever we're invested in an actual miner itself. It's never just the commodity price, but there's also the operational side and things like mine closures and the like. And again, our history has been littered with them over the journey. If you get that going on for long enough, that is going to create a major impact. And in the case of RSG, it's not that it's just been this period where it's been you know, very, very low and zero in regards to deaths. But it's also been that way for the last few years, which also adds an element of confidence. But then the cynic in me says, well, the longer you go without brings you closer to a period with. But then again, I think, you know, in terms of management and their tried and true performance, at least the mines look stable and that has effectively worked in RSG's favour. Fantastic. Elio D'Amato, thank you very much for your golden thoughts. Thank you, Phil. Thanks for listening to Shares for Beginners. You can find more at sharesforbeginners.com. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future. 